Welcome to Wrestling Roundtable Radio, back on the air at blogtalkradio.com slash wrestlingroundtable at gofightlive.tv or gfl.tv or gofightlive.com. they got so many addresses, I can't keep track of them all. Go Fight Live site, whatever it is. And, of course, WrestlingRoundTable.com. I'm the host, Eric Santa Maria. been working in wrestling almost seven years. I think it's going to be a couple weeks away. That'll be my seventh anniversary as a full-time. Well, actually, I started off part-time for the first year. But working in wrestling for the past seven years, unbelievable. <laughs> Don't know how much longer that's going to last, but let's just see how long it goes on. And wanted to remind you, now that I just mentioned WrestlingRoundTable.com, to go to that site, please. There's going to be a big site update over the course of the next week, planning a news update for you, all the latest videos, the latest Battle of Wills, of course, our last several radio shows. There's going to be some more recaps, a new WCW recap coming up, and of course, the Wrestling Roundtable store, where you can support the Wrestling Roundtable. It's kind of like we're the PBS of wrestling and MMA talk, brought to you by viewers like you. Support the Wrestling Roundtable, please. Get the Wrestling Roundtable t-shirt at our store, and you can go to our Amazon store, too, where you can get anything on Amazon.com and get us a cut of it. A very fucking small cut, thanks, Amazon, but a cut nonetheless. So, introducing the panel for the night, want to introduce first, Coriander Ake out in Chicago. Hey, Cory. Hello, Eric. Good evening, everyone. And also up on the panel is one half of Battle of Wills, Will Effin Brooks, who is in our chat room every Monday night during Raw, as he is right now chatting with all of you listening live. Hey, Will. Yo, everybody, what's going on? The Phillies are up 2-1 to one in the Divisional Series, and I can't be happier about it. I guess we're going to get right down to it with Mixed Martial Arts first up, Will Brooks, because big pay-per-view, and it seems like there's a UFC every weekend. <laughs> I mean, we're in the midst of... I think four weekends in a row that there's been UFC. There's one more coming up on Saturday. That's 136 with the Edgar Maynard 3 rematch. And it's starting to become more often than not that they have all these shows in a row. And the news just broke this week that the upcoming show in Japan, the return to Japan, is going to be on the same night as a Las Vegas-based pay-per-view. Originally, it seemed to be that their pay-per-view was going to air live from Japan. It was going to start at like 10 a.m. in Japan, so it could air live here in the primetime spot. That was the original story. But now, it seems that the Japan show is going to be on free TV. I guess it would be FX or whatever they're on by that point. And the pay-per-view is going to air from Las Vegas. And I remember earlier this year when we were talking about the WrestleMania True Story documentary about WrestleMania 2 and how it was simulcast in three different locations in North America, and that was just North America. And I said, the only promoter I could think of even trying something like that now is Dana White, and I guess he's going to do something akin to it. I don't know exactly how it's going to work out, if they're going to maybe air some fights from Japan during the pay-per-view or whatever, but uh, that's across the globe, let alone across the country, so... I can't believe some of the stuff they're doing, but this event in Denver, Colorado that we're going to talk about that just happened, UFC 135 from the Pepsi Center is their return to Denver, Colorado, which is where the first UFC event happened. And it seems like this year they're not only going into new markets for the first time, such as the battle on the Bayou event that we just talked about on the last show and other sort of places, but they're returning to different places, Denver, Colorado, Brazil, Japan. Lots of expansion going on with UFC, but UFC 135, like I said, from the Pepsi Center in Colorado, opened with Nate Diaz defeating Takanori Gomi in the lightweight division. And I think you'll see the same story echoed later on in the main event, which we will get to. But essentially, Takanori Gomi could not penetrate Nate Diaz's reach. The Diaz brothers, street thugs as they may be, (laughs) are very talented fighters and It was an impenetrable wall that his reach was for Gomi to get through. It was like if (laughs) Nate Diaz was the castle, the arms that he was punching with were the moat, and Gomi just could not navigate past that. He couldn't close the distance, and eventually he was just overwhelmed by it. And what a beautiful transition from the triangle choke into the armbar submission finish. And unfortunately, yet again, 
another Japanese fighter goes down in UFC. It's a real shame, as you may have read on our website, Jamal Reynolds wrote a nice article about karate and kung fu and their origins. And before that, jiu-jitsu and judo, comparing those two styles. And when people generally think of Japan, they think of martial arts. So many styles originated there, so many combat. It's like a fighting nation. Sumo, judo, karate, even covering fake fighting, pro wrestling in the newspapers. And that's also where UWFI, that style, the work shoot style of pro wrestling came about. But outside of Pride, where they had a lot of biased judging and fixing fights to make their Japanese fighters look good, we haven't seen one UFC champion yet of Japanese origin. The most successful, I guess, has been Okami, but he couldn't make that big jump over Anderson Silva. And everyone else has not been faring too well outside of, I guess, Takeya Mizugaki, who, of course, lost against Uriah Faber in Faber's bantamweight debut in WEC. But at least he got a victory in UFC recently, so he's on the right track there. But it was also on a prelim. So anyway, Takanori Gomi going down to Nate Diaz. Your thoughts on the opener of 135. You know, people don't talk about Nate Diaz as much because his brother Nick Diaz is so good. But Nate Diaz, he's got some sick Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And so him winning by submission never shocks me. Especially with those long-ass legs. He's like Anderson Silva. He gets people in those arm triangles, like, very easily. So him beating Gomi wasn't a huge shock to me, especially when it went to the ground. I, I had Nate mm-hmm. Diaz the whole way on the ground. Well, it's funny because the Diaz brothers, yes, they've got great jiu-jitsu, but it seems like they don't want to use it most of the time in the sense that they want to stand with their opponents like we just saw Earlier this year, Nick Diaz and Paul Daly, it was just a bang-out fight on the feet. In this fight, too, Nate Diaz was showing off his boxing skills, too. Yeah, both pros are really good. They're very solid fighters. So when they win, it's not as shocking as I think people like make it out to be. I still would have rather seen Nick Diaz face GSP, though, but whatever. <laughs> well, Gomi going down, several fights lost in a row now, just like Yoshihiro Akiyama. So hopefully some of these Japanese fighters can get back on the winning streak. And going up the card, I wasn't really planning on talking well about the heavyweight fights because the two heavyweight fights are pretty much the same story. A lot of people were giving the UFC booker or matchmaker Joe Silva some criticism for booking heavyweights in Denver, Colorado in the first place because history has shown all these heavyweights get blown up in the thin air. They have to carry the most weight. And we saw pretty much every other division that night up to and including the light heavyweight championship fight. The other fighters don't have this sort of problem. So do you think they should just avoid booking heavyweights in high-altitude fights? No. Not at all. You're a trained so you fighter. think it's up to them to to have better conditioning? Dude, yeah, you're a fucking professional fighter. Train like it. Act like it. Fight like it. Get over it. If NFL linemen can do it, your ass can do it. <laughs> all right. Well, I didn't really have too much to say about either one of those fights, really, because it was pretty much the same story, in my opinion. So jumping ahead to the welterweight fight, which was the co-main event, Josh Koscheck finally got the match that he always wanted all these years against Matt Hughes. And when you say that he defeated or knocked out Matt Hughes at the last second, it literally means the last second. Four minutes and 59 seconds of round one. He knocked him out with some strikes and finished him off with some hammer fists. And Matt Hughes knocked out yet again in one of his recent fights. So Koscheck getting back on track after the loss from GSP. And Matt Hughes... I don't know, Will. He hasn't looked too good recently. I mean, we saw him get knocked out in, what, like eight seconds from BJ Penn last year or so? And Matt Hughes didn't say the word retire. He said he's not retired, but Dana White said afterwards he's pretty much retired. He just didn't want to say it. And Hughes is taking the stance that he just wanted to have interesting fights for now on. But really, what could those possibly be? I mean, he's got the new DVD set to commemorate his career, WWE style, when they put out a DVD set of guys with their best matches and a documentary, etc. He's already a Hall of Famer. What else does he have left to prove? Is it really the end for Matt Hughes? And your thoughts on Koscheck's victory? Absolutely the end of Matt Hughes. At least Matt Hughes has an incredible, legitimate fighter. Koscheck was pretty much controlling the whole fight. When he took him down and he was striking, I'm thinking, oh, I didn't think he had enough time. I really didn't. And then, like, when you saw the replay, Hughes was out. So it wasn't like a crap finish. It, he was out. It was legitimate. And the ref did the right thing. It was credible. Good for Koscheck. Hughes, you probably got one or two fights left in you, dude. Make sure, like, they're against someone who we care about. Like, Matt Hughes was Matt Sarah, too, or something like that. Hmm. Well, moving on to the main event, which was for the light heavyweight title. 
the champion John Bones Jones dominating utterly Quentin Rampage Jackson, who people were saying he's in the best shape of his life. Rampage said it himself. This is the best Rampage. Of course, Steven Seagal disagreed afterwards, and I remember Ariel Hawani asking him, well, what do you mean? I wanted him to board out. Well, he lost. How could he possibly be the best he's been when he lost? But as it was, I think it really was the same story as Nate Diaz and Takanori Gumi at the beginning of the night, because once again, that reach, those long limbs on John Jones, like Rampage said, he could fire from afar. He could throw punches from far away with that, and last time on the show we were talking about leg kicks, and we saw a few of those, but I think it was more just like an overwhelming assault from John Jones. Uh, we talk about Anderson Silva being the spider, but I think John Jones was like a tarantula on, on Rampage. He, it pretty much went like I expected. It didn't seem like he was in any trouble whatsoever at any point in this fight, completely in control, and he went on to become the second person to ever submit Quentin Rampage Jackson in the fourth round. And afterwards, I was thinking about how I said on this show a while ago, sometime last year, when he was still coming up, you put this guy in the cage for the title, he wins. And people were poo-pooing that idea. Oh, no, I don't really think so. Here he is, the champ. And after watching him fight, well, I don't see who could really possibly beat him. Now, I'm a fan of his skill. But still a part of me as this was unfolding was hoping that Quentin Rampage with that puncher's chance might have connected with this huge right hook because I think that might have been his only chance to just hopefully catch him with one big punch and knock him out because that would have been big. And we all liked seeing moments in MMA like that. It didn't work out like that. And John Jones goes on to face Rashad Evans. And I'm really starting to see now what people are saying about him being a cocky little snob because <laughs> – for me, it was one thing to not look into the eye of whoever he's facing off at the weigh-ins. Then he wouldn't even look in Rashad Evans face-to-face, -face, like just completely dismissing him. But to not admit Steven Seagal into the locker room before the fight, who does John Jones think he is? Instead of getting a fourth-round submission, if he had let Steven Seagal in that locker room and just talked to him for a minute, I bet it would have been a first-round knockout with a front kick. <laughs> but uh, as it was... Rashad Evans, John Jones is next. So, Will Brooks, your thoughts on Bones defeating Rampage in such dominant fashion? Well, first off, I want to say Rampage has never been finished in a UFC cage before to the last mm -hmm. that time. Good for Bones. It just kind of adds to his like, growing legacy right now. My mm -hmm. his, his whole R. I have to agree with you. At the moment, it looks like no one can beat Jones. Just like I don't think anyone really can it's better than Cain Velasquez and it's in that division or GSP or Silver. It seems like everybody has a pretty clear cut champion in these divisions. Which could be a good thing, but it also leads to great upsets when they finally do fall. Sure. Uh, but like you were saying, man, the reach was hurting them. It seems like Rampage has never got any better at taking leg kicks. I mean that's like basic now. Like I'm sorry, if I was facing Rampage, I'd do nothing but throw leg kicks at him. Like all fight. I'd make him smitten by bruised leg. Okay? I would not even try to swing with him. I part of me does agree with you, yes. I would have been kind of cool to see Rampage throw a hook and maybe connect and maybe put Jones down, see what he looks like when he's actually in trouble. But mm -hmm. I do agree. But same time, though, where you said if he didn't look at him, maybe he's a little cocky. I'm sorry. Did you did you see Rampage look, like his look when he gets in you guys' face? I'm sorry. I wouldn't look at him either. I was like, that made me laugh. <laughs> I'd probably start laughing right in the moment. It would throw me off my game. So, well, it just seems like it's a pattern with John Jones. He's not the only person he did it to. I can't let you just look at the guy in the eye. Oh, no, just look at the guy in the eye. Who cares? He's still fighting the guy. It's not like he's running away. He's fighting the guy. Who cares if he looks him in the eye? Oh, he punches him in the face. <laughs> I guess it's not gay if you don't make eye contact, huh? <laughs> or if you say good game. <laughs> All right, well, lots of talk going on about John Jones and UFC and everything in our chat room right now. I want to invite you to call in. The number is 347-857-4647. So call in and share your thoughts and opinions on what's going on in the world of mixed martial arts and pro wrestling. Hell, it doesn't even have to be what's going on. If you want to ask a question about the past or make a comment about the past, whatever you want to do, the number is 347-857-4647. We're going to move on to pro wrestling. And first up, Coriander Ake. When we were on the show last time, I mentioned that everyone should get the Wrestling Roundtable t-shirt. And one of the ways I mentioned it is in the context of you wore it to a wrestling show and you got 
a lot of recognition for it. People recognized you from the show, came up and talked to you. Will Brooks, you said you've been recognized from uh, wearing the round table shirt too, right? A little bit. I got recognized a lot at the RA show, but I got a funny story my girlfriend told me. She's a bartender in Philly, and she said she heard two guys talking about wrestling. And my girlfriend doesn't know nothing about wrestling, but I did show her a raw one time. And she's watched a couple episodes of D2 Long Island Story. Now she's a huge Zack Ryder fan. She never shut up about saying woo, woo, woo. She said it all the time. <laughs> and so she heard these two guys talking about wrestling, and she said, hey, woo, woo, woo. And they said, well, you like wrestling? She's like, no, I just like Zack Ryder. But my boyfriend loves wrestling. And she asked him if they walked the round table. They said yes. And wow. she's like, oh, do you want really? Battle of Will? And she's like, do you guys want Battle of Will? She's like, yes. That's my boyfriend. Which one? Will. <laughs> <laughs> And they're like, which Will? Like, Will Effin Brooks. She actually called me by my name, Will Effin Brooks. That's really something, man. I mean, I'm constantly blown away by really the power of the Internet, the age that we live in, because I guess we're around the same age group, Will Brooks, where I really consider us in the transition generation. Now, I'm a videographer. People know that I do videography and pro wrestling, and that's been something I've been doing, of course, all the roundtable videos, that's me, and cutting it together and everything. And when I started learning in high school, I was really in that transition period between analog and digital. So to put it in layman's terms, if you were to cut shit together on two VCRs with a VHS tape, that's essentially what the old era was like. Now everything's digital on a computer, and everything's nonlinear, as they call it. So we started learning a little of both. Now, of course, that same class is learning pretty much all digital stuff. Well, we're in the generation that we still remember, like, rotary dial phones and before there were cell phones and way before the Internet and stuff like that. And now these kids that are born not with a 19 in the year but a 20, they're never going to know a time where there wasn't this sort of stuff. And, of course, it does make you feel a little old, but at the same time, the power of the Internet is just really amazing, like – between the story you just told and the story Corey told last time of this woman who was moving to Chicago and trying to learn better English because she enjoyed the show so much, it, it really just boggles my mind every time we hear about the reach and the scope of the show. And of course, the majority of our fans are from America and English-speaking countries, usually in the UK and whatnot, but... We've got fans in Germany, the Netherlands, all over the world. And it's really cool to know that people are tuning in and hopefully they're enjoying as well. So, Corey, I mentioned that woman who was trying to better her English because she enjoyed the show so much. And you ran into her at a show in Chicago that you were attending. So tell us about that for a little bit. Yeah, I was at the Dragon Gate show up in Chicago and it was a very interesting show. This was an eye pay per view. Two matches I wanted to point out because they are so much unlike anything that's on television outside of Ring of Honor. One match in particular was Johnny Gargano versus Akira Tozawa. And I don't know how this translates on the eye pay per view, but live, this was incredible. Tozawa had gotten kicked in the head by Gargano, and his ear just started bleeding all over the place. And the referee is screaming at him, let's stop the match, let's cut it here, go get some help. And Tozawa's like, no, I'm fine, I can keep wrestling. And he actually did beat Gargano. This was a very hard-hitting match, and I hope that it translates as well onto pay-per-view feed as it did live. The second match I wanted to bring up was, of course, the main event, Yamato versus Shima. This match, I think, went pretty long, but you really wouldn't notice it. Lots of hard-hitting moves. Lots of high energy in this match. This was not just a spot fest. There were spots where the two did catch-style wrestling, spots where it was very technical. And this is what reminded me of why I'm a wrestling fan, and I'd love to see more matches that are very technical like this one. All right, it's a cheap shot, but somehow I doubt you've ever actually seen real catch wrestling. I YouTube it. (laughs) <laughs> YouTube Tony Ciccini, he's awesome. If you want to see what a real STFU looks like, a shoot one, Tony Ciccini. It's my guy. Learn from Luthes. Anyway, moving on from DG USA, I want to go on to Ring of Honor. And before I go on to Ring of Honor, who just debuted on Sinclair's Broadcasting Network, or whatever you want to call it, wanted to read some poll results because we've got some new polls 
up right now on WrestlingRoundTable.com. The new polls are, what style do you think best suits MMA if you were, let's say, going to be a UFC fighter? If you want to be the ultimate fighter, what's the background you think is most important? And the other one is, what's WWE's real biggest OMG moment? They just put out the DVD, Top 50 OMG, oh my God, moments in WWE history, which you can get at our Amazon store. But uh, there's some alternatives that probably weren't on there. So that's the poll right now, and the last polls are the ones I wanted to read the results of. Now, these two polls had answers that I knew everyone would vote for. They were obvious answers. It's not even for them. I wanted to see what else besides the obvious answers would get the votes. I usually read these results in ascending order. I'm going to do it descending now because it's going to be pretty interesting to see what else got votes here. So, firstly... Speaking of Ring of Honor, what indie do you want to see make it big the most? Obviously, right now, we're in a wrestling landscape where that is much, much different. People just need to get this through their heads. That is much different than the Monday Night War slash Attitude Era. Back then, let's say 1998 especially, wrestling was hot. I mean, across the board. The difference between number one and number two and number three, WWF, WCW, ECW, it was a lot closer than it is today, okay? TNA is a far distance number two to WWE, and ROH is an even further distance number three from TNA. So there's obvious room for improvement here, but of all these indie groups, which one do you want to see get bigger, make it a little more successful in the wrestling industry as it is? No surprise, 75% voted for Ring of Honor. It's been around almost 10 years. Coming up this February will be their 10th anniversary. And the most reputable, I would suppose, TNA at one point could have thanked their roster, and maybe they still could thank Ring of Honor for half the roster. Moving down in this ROH domination, 9% voted for Pro Wrestling Guerrilla, based out in California, which some people call the West Coast version of Ring of Honor, since they use so many of the same people. 5% of you were creeps and voted for Shimmer Women's Wrestling. <laughs> Wonder how many basement-dwelling old men order this stuff. 4% voted for Chikara. Yeah. 2% voted for Billy Corgan's Indie. And yes, Corey, we all know it's Resistance Pro. Especially if you read the news at WrestlingRoundTable.com, you would know the name. I'm just putting it in layman's terms because people heard Billy Corgan is an Indie. 2% also voted for Juggalo Championship Wrestling, which... Just put on a Heroes of Wrestling-esque Legends pay-per-view at, like, what, 2 in the morning uh, <laughs> last month or so? Another 2%, three-way tie, went to CZW, Combat Zone Wrestling, now owned by DJ Hyde. They still run shows at the ECW Arena, now known as the Asylum Arena, for the Asylum Fight League, MMA. But people keep saying, well, it's not as hardcore as it used to be, and DJ Hyde's trying to take it in another direction. And yet every time I hear that, the next thing is the Tournament of Death, and all this other Cage of Death sort of shit. So, one step forward, two steps back, I suppose. 1%. Went to the indie just mentioned by Corey, Dragon Gate USA, and happily, 0% went to Evolve. I guess maybe they need to evolve, because what's the alternative? Extinction. I think that seems a little more likely. 0% for Evolve. Moving on to the next poll result. Who should be in WWE's 2012 Hall of Fame class? Now again, this was pretty overwhelming. 77%. Voted for the Macho Man Randy Savage. Of course, it's in Florida. He should have been in long ago. Now that he's dead, I guess it's okay. Let's see if they go through with it. 9% voted for The Rock. Coming in second. Of course, again, in Florida. And really, if they wanted to do it, I don't see why not. 6% went to another Samoan, Yokozuna. Macho Man, if he goes in, I don't think Yokozuna goes in. They seem to have this thing like they only induct one dead person per show. And since there's so many dead wrestlers, they've got a seemingly endless supply. When's Rick Rude going to go in? When's Boss Man going to go in? They'll put an earthquake. I mean, if Coco Beware got in, that pretty much lowered the bar, and there'll be tons of possible candidates now. But what I love about Yokozuna is his initial shtick in WWE is just a perfect example of pro wrestling. You have an American Samoan, and I mean not from American Samoa, but American Samoan in the sense that he was born, I believe, in San Francisco, in America, just of Samoan descent. So you have a Samoan pretending to be Japanese. 
everyone buys it. Just love that. Coming up next, 5% went to demolition. I assume this means Axe and Smash, because, of course, Crush is yet another dead wrestler. Came later, and the classic demolition is Axe and Smash. That, remember, speaking of yet another dead wrestler, what they really ought to do is just make a dead year. I know they don't want to drag out all these family members in place of these dead wrestlers, all these relatives to accept on behalf of them. But it would really clear out a whole bunch on that list. Just make it a whole dead year and get rid of all these names that are in reserve all at once. 2% getting down to the bottom of the list now. 2% went to Cindy Lauper. She was my vote because when we had the celebrity poll, I think a while back, she should have been on there, man, because if you're going to have a celebrity wing, how do you not put Cindy Lauper in? She was such a focal point for the Rock and Wrestling Connection. So, to a degree, we have Cindy Lauper to thank for pretty much wrestling as it is right now. To a degree. All the good times, give it up for Cindy Lauper. And only 1% of you voted for Medusa. I don't know. She's a pioneer for women's wrestling, and they just did a feature on her, and I think on uh, www.com. And really, if they brought back... Um, uh, what the fuck is her name? <laughs> Corey, help me with this one. WrestleMania one. She was the women's champion. That oh, Wendy Richter. Wendy Richter. If they brought back, if they brought back Wendy Richter, I'm pretty sure they could induct Medusa. Glad I remembered that one. So anyway, those are some of the poll results on WrestlingRoundtable.com right now on the site. There are new polls, and before we move on to Ring of Honor, as I mentioned. We've got Justin from Eagle, Wisconsin on our line. So let me bring up Justin, and let's see what's on your mind. Go ahead. I'm just here to put in my input on the ROH broadcast, since I was there both live and about the 1% of the American populace actually got the program. I think that's a little generous, but go ahead. (laughs) Ow. (laughs) Quality-wise, I'd say it's very low, even for ROH standards. I felt like now, I you're was talking watching. about the broadcast, not the live event. <laughs> now, now, live event was much better quality. Almost okay. HD-like. But yeah, the broadcast, I felt like I was watching uh, the old OVW tapes, like worse than ECW VHS quality. So the picture quality you're talking about? Picture quality and the production as well. They're well, like, wait till they're uh, going to air from the Danny Davis Arena that they taped this past weekend. Then it'll really look like OVW. <laughs> Large sections of the arena were blacked out. Some of the wrestlers just, like, faded into the shadows when they went outside the ring. And I wasn't too impressed with the way they structured the program overall. Well, and before you get to the structure, Justin, let me chime in on that. Because I watched a few minutes of the first show because I was curious to see how it looked, of course. Now, being that I was watching on the Internet, I didn't see on my TV and HD and all that other sort of stuff. But let's see if you agree on this, Chicago. uh, Chicago. Let's see if you agree on this, Corey, because I'm not sure, Justin, how many shows you've been to. But Corey's been to a lot in that building, and so have I. And when I was watching the SBG show, I was really shocked at how bad it looked, really. And it was all for the lighting. Now, Corey, you've seen on DVD and taped pay-per-view in years past how good this building can look, especially, for instance, on WrestleMania weekend when it's really packed. Now, I assume there were probably about 1,000, 1,200, whatever people in the building that night. You would never fucking know because it was practically blacked out. The lighting was not only focused on the ring and the arena kept dark, but it was also very smoky. I know ROH loves their smoke machine, but why would you want to have that look Even if it's to bring out the lights, it drowns out the crowd. It really didn't look very good. And you know, Corey, that that building can look good. There were people there. Why not show it? I I really did not understand that lighting choice. So your thoughts on just how it visually looked before we get to the structure of the show, Corey? Well, visually, yeah, I'm going to have to say it. The lighting was pretty bad on the taping. There were spots where it looked too bright. Other spots where it didn't look bright enough, it looked like there was a contrast issue, especially during the Bravado Brothers match. There was a scene where Lancelot gets slammed into the barricade, and all of a sudden the feed goes from light to very dark, and you can't see him anymore, and you can't see the fans at all. Mm -hmm. And for the record, I had to watch this via the website. I couldn't get this on television because my market doesn't have a Sinclair channel yet. Most people can say the same thing, though. 
A lot of the matches looked way too dark. There were also spots on the Internet feed, I'm not sure if this translates on television, where it seems like there are just big square patches. Like, you'll see the wrestlers, and then behind them it looks like there's this square patch. And I know the square patch should be dark lighting over the crowd, but instead all you see is just squares, and that's really not very good. There were other spots where the crowd that's, just... That's, I'm sorry not to cut you off, Corey, but that's digitized blocking that occurs in uh, video depending on the quality. So that's on the website that you were seeing it, and that's probably why. I don't think the television broadcast looked like that. There was a spot, too, during the Bravados match and the main event where it seemed like everything just turned blue for a little bit. I hope that this was just a one-time error and that this gets fixed because it didn't quite translate very well. It did detract from these matches. Okay, well, Unstable Comet in our chat room just said, it seems that most channels have been showing episodes out of order or showing the same episode two weeks in a row. Oh, boy. Now, I always am hesitant to call a wrestling show an episode because it's supposed to at least pretend to be a sport, so you wouldn't say I watched the episode of baseball last night. I don't say the same thing for wrestling, so that's just my own semantic opinion. But either way, what he brings up is a valid point, and that's what I wanted to point out. Some dirty little secret that no one's been telling you about Ring of Honor is that because Sinclair's network's whatever market they're in, they're broadcasting on different channels on different days at different times. So it's not the same thing, let's say, if you were going to say, watch TNA Impact Thursdays at 9 on Spike TV. Now, everyone has a different number depending on their cable provider, of course, but at least when it's Thursday at 9, you know, okay, I need to find Spike TV. It's not the same thing here. It's on a different channel at a different time in every market, so there's going to be confusion there. And a lot of markets don't have it, so a lot of people are going to be watching on the Internet. They seem to be doing fine with that. A lot of people are watching it on their website. But not only are we seeing different shows accidentally aired or not aired, depending on the market, someone on our Facebook page, when the subject came up, mentioned that the first show, I believe in West Virginia, was where he was watching it. He only got to see the last 15 minutes of it because it was preempted due to a football game. Now, being that they were bought by Sinclair long before this was even supposed to have happened, now we've got UFC on Fox coming up. Now, there are Fox affiliates that are airing ROH on Sinclair markets, whatever it might be, for instance, in Richmond. Now, there's no way that a live UFC isn't going to bump whatever was going to be airing locally or whatever in that specific market. So that's just one. You've got UFC, you've got football games, you've got who knows what else, depending on the market. So this is going to be a big problem going forward, let alone what's airing. I mean, just today I was reading about, I believe in Pittsburgh, airing the first show this weekend when the second show was supposed to air. So there's lots of different problems that are needing to be sorted out. And you'd think a broadcasting company in 2011 would be more on this. But that's just an example of some of the things that you're not hearing about ROH's new venture in syndicated television. I mean, obviously, everyone knows about its reach. People have been complaining about that for a while now. But a lot of people are watching it on the Internet, at least, and hopefully there's not too much artifacting, like Corey was saying. But back to Justin in Eagle, Wisconsin, on to the actual content of the show itself, you had some things to say on it. There were two matches on the first show, and they were both tag matches. I didn't quite have a problem with that. I mean, it's a good way for ROH to show that it takes value in different styles. Both tag matches are really good. My problem is that it was just two matches for a full hour period. That That isn't enough if you're trying to show that you're a serious wrestling company. Sure, I, I can understand that for the first episode. You're trying to introduce your audience, have, like, some facts, recaps, introduce the talent. But I don't think it's going to do too well over a four-week period, just two matches every hour. I was, I was At the event, I was wondering, how are they going to do this? Are the, are the shows going to be a half hour long or just going to be a full hour long? What are they going to do to fill up that time? And I think it's, the shows are just going to be dissatisfying to the fans who really want to watch. I understand why they only went with the two matches. Between the matches, there were a lot of recap segments, and I feel that those segments were 
pretty decently edited to show the new audience what Reign of Honor is all about. I have a couple of friends on Facebook who weren't that familiar with Reign of Honor, and they actually enjoyed some of these segments. Longtime fans, though, thought it was unnecessary. I'm sort of on the fence. I think it was all right for the first show. The feel of the matches, it really strikes me as more of an NWA style. Cornette definitely took it in a more old-school direction then, because this felt like an NWA show more than it did Reign of Honor or OVW. Mm-hmm. That's not necessarily bad, though. Lance Storm actually praised the first episode on his website. Well, except the bravados. Yeah, he had some disparaging remarks about the bravados. I didn't think that was fair, but to each his own, I suppose. Well, we're also talking about a guy who just decided a couple months ago, I'm going to quit watching MMA because Josh Barnett and Chow Sun do steroids. Whoa! What the fuck was that hypocritical bullshit? If he's that self-righteous about steroids, how do you even get in wrestling in the first place and last as long as he did? And I like Lance Storm, but I just thought that was outrageously silly. At any rate, any other thoughts, Corey or Justin, on the first show and going forward? I'm interested to see where they take it from here. I think that the next few tapings are really going to be a lot better. Well, I hope that they don't like continue on with this style, that they have like more matches in the future. I'm just worried that newer fans are going to be discouraged with, like, these first four weeks of tapings, showing that it's only two matches per broadcast. I'm hoping for the best for ROH, and I'm hoping that they, like, have three, maybe four matches for the future. But I'm just thinking that that, that these four, first four weeks are going to be a little bit of a disappointment for fans. Well, do you think that taping four shows at a time, especially in the age of the Internet, and this is a company whose fan base has been Internet-based since they've existed. Do you think that four shows in advance at a time is way too much? Uh, no, I don't think it's too much. I'm just basing it off of what, what I saw WWE do with ECW. That they managed to fit a good amount of matches in that hour time span. Well, I'm just talking in terms of spoilers. We were just talking about on the previous, one of our previous shows about how the live SmackDown did such a huge rating compared to what they usually do, and it seemed to really show how as much as people say that uh, we don't like watching a tape show compared to a live show, if we had a choice, we would watch the live show, it seemed to prove them right, just in terms of sheer numbers, as far as WWE's crowd. Now, Corey, do you think that taping so far in advance is a detractment, especially when they're trying to attract new fans, so to speak? It can be, especially for those in the crowd who I caught tweeting the results as the show was going on. It's going to be a lot more difficult to keep fans from reading spoilers when you tape that far in advance, especially when you've got iPay-per-views to think about. The next time they have an iPay-per-view, if, say, we have a different champion That's going to look really awkward when it comes to the television show. I think that for the next couple of tapings, they might want to scale back a bit. Instead of four tapings, do three. There were a lot of restless people in the crowd at the Chicago tapings. There were large groups of people that kept leaving in the middle of the taping show because, of course, Chicago has never had a Ring of Honor TV taping before. So a lot of fans did not understand. They may never again. (laughs) A lot of fans didn't understand that when you say this is your main event, that meant for taping one. There's four more main events coming up. So they might want to think about how that's structured for the next time. Maybe tape some of the matches out of order, and hopefully you can hold on to those people a little bit longer. Hopefully we can hold on to this audience a little bit longer. 347-857-4647. Please call in and talk to us. We need somebody to talk to. We're lonely. Let's move on to WWE's Hell in a Cell pay-per-view. I could have sworn it was Hell in the Cell, not a cell. Hell in a Cell 2011, which was in New Orleans and opened with Sheamus defeating Christian, defeating him with a broad kick and a pinfall. Corey, your thoughts on the opener of the Ginger beating, I guess, the Christian? It was an all right match. It didn't really feel like a pay-per-view quality match, though. This is something you expect on SmackDown, not at a pay-per-view. And there was just no build going into this match at all. They really didn't take any effort whatsoever into making this feel special. And I suppose I can understand, since they were smart enough, in quotations, to book this match two weeks after a pay-per-view, but still, I wish there was something more going into this match. Outside of that, though, it was okay. Just okay. Moving on to the Sincata e Sincata match, 
just for the sake of argument. I'm not going to call him Dark Sin Car like some people have for the heel. I'll just call him Mystico and Hunico. Mystico coming back. He got the victory over Hunico. And was it a botch fest, Corey? There were some segments where the match was all right and other segments where I just couldn't help but wonder, who the fuck hired these guys? I'm glad that they want to end this feud. I'm glad that Mystico won. But this is something that I hope is over because I'm just sick of the whole thing now. And it sounded like a lot of the crowd was sick of it, too. Let's go to a call before we move on because we got someone on the line. The number is 601 area code. Name and location, please. You're on with Roundtable. Yeah, this is Gerald calling from Mississippi. Gerald Bynum, hello. You enjoying your Roundtable t-shirt? I am. I am, man. I really appreciate it, my man. How was that Pro Wrestling Respect DVD, by the way? Oh, I had to check it out, man. I'm, I'm going to check it out, man, within the next couple of weeks and give you a review on that, my man. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks for purchasing that at WrestlingRoundtable.com. Hope everyone else follows suit. And I don't know if you saw it, because it probably has been buried by now, but I put a thread on the message board for the Respect DVD because I wanted to see the opinion of people who have seen the actual show of what you think about how Wrestling Roundtable did actually producing a live wrestling show for a change. So when you do get the chance, look up that thread. And a hint, if you go in the search box on the message board, type quotation marks before and after whatever you type, and the stuff will pop up a lot easier. Jamal found that out, and he's also the other person who posted on that thread, too. So you attended the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view in New Orleans, and uh-huh. we just talked about Sheamus and Christian and the Mystico match. So uh, any thoughts on the opener and the Mystico match? Well, I feel like the opener was – felt like they did quite well with – Pretty strong, pretty hot. Um, kind of old school, and it just gave us the just the. I guess they just had the point of just hey, let's just start strong and just get the crowd hyped, and uh, it worked out well for us. Mm-hmm. Actually, they started out well with the dark match too, with Dane Bryan coming in pretty solidly with that. It was pretty solid. Uh, it was a pleasant surprise to see him, as uh, it's been discussed over the message boards. It's a shame that he's not on the main show, but otherwise, it was good to see him in person. Uh, JTG had a decent performance, also. That was solid. And then when we started off with the show that was on TV, it was a hot opener. And the Sin Cara match, a few botches here and there, but nothing that wasn't forgivable. And uh, also, there was a few boring chants from the crowd, which I kind of disagree with. I guess people just kind of forget that there's more than one style of wrestling, I would say. Overall, they worked it pretty well. Well, I figured out several years ago that WW audiences pop for usually, like, one of three things. A high spot, a finisher, or someone going through a table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not much patience for much else. But uh, the tag champions, Airborne, defended against Vicky Guerrero's stable of... Jack Swagger and the U.S. champion Dolph Ziggler. Ziggler will not be a double champion this time. Corey, your thoughts on the tag match? Are you at least happy that the tag titles are being defended on pay-per-view and not switching every month like every other title? Yes, this is actually one of the few good points of Hell in a Cell that I did like. I liked that the tag team titles were treated as titles and not a joke this time. And I liked that the right guys are still retaining it, because I am a big fan of Air Boom. The match was all right, but again, this felt like a Raw match. This is something that definitely should have had more build-up for it. Speaking of Raw, I would love to titty-fuck Vicky Guerrero. Gerald, your thoughts on the match? <laughs> Oh well. First off, I, I do think that Vicky is very attractive, but anyway, yeah, it was it did have that raw feel to it, but that was mainly because of just the lack of build up. Otherwise, it was another strong match for the show. Right people are winning, and I am glad that they're getting treated like titles like they're supposed to be, like it was from way back when. Speaking of which, just as a general consensus throughout the night, how hot was the crowd? Were they into a lot of things, or was it more like that? one match with Daniel Bryan where they weren't too into it. Were they up for anything, or was it just like a roller coaster throughout the night? Well, overall, New Orleans just had a problem with crowd control as far as just managing people going in and out. Uh, once we filled it in, which was like basically right before the show hit airwaves, once we filled it in, we were pretty hot for just about everything throughout other than, I would say, the Sinkar match and the Divas match toward the end. Other than that, we were pretty hot through the whole thing. Cool. Next up was the first Hell in a Cell matchup, which was the World Heavyweight Championship match between Mark Henry and Randy Orton. And I cannot tell you how giddy, how happy I am about this whole Mark Henry thing. I just love 
And I don't know how much anti Randy Ortonism it is. And I don't I have no love lost for Randy Orton and really it's got very little to me to do with this whole idea. But I just love the idea that Mark Henry is so accepted right now in this role because it's old school. And I'm going to connect it to the next segment, too, when it comes up with the Intercontinental title. But this whole thing is just so fucking old school. You just build up a monster heel. You make him credible. He takes out people. He gets victories. He gets the title. He cuts believable promos. And guess what? Yeah, it's Mark Henry. Everyone was hating on him a couple months ago, and yeah, he's the worst wrestler of all that other shit. But now, all of a sudden, everybody loves it. Everyone accepts him. The internet is so cool with it, and I just love the idea. Because Mark Henry, I think, is a pretty likable guy. He seems like he's not like an egomaniac. You don't hear any stories about him. Hey, he may not be the best wrestler in the world. Far from it. But he goes out there and does the best he can and has for a long time. And I think that really helped with this, too, because everyone knows he's been there a long time. He does the best he can, and they've given him a solid, basic, old-school push, an old-school program, an old-school run, and it works. You see how easy it is when they keep it simple, stupid? It's got nothing to do with fucking running over dogs or spilling coffee or I need to be the figurehead or any of this other contrived bullshit. No work shoot stuff either, Pat, but just a good old-fashioned fucking storyline and it's the thing everyone's happy about the most and on top of that we get to hell in a cell he kicks out of the fucking rko and wins clean and everyone was fearing as good as it's been maybe it's only going to be short-lived and they don't have the patience for it and they're going to put it right back on fucking randy orton when they shouldn't have they're just going to do it anyway because they fuck up everything and they're stupid blah 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 and they didn't do it and everyone loved it I just love that this is going on with Mark Henry right now. How was it live in the crowd, Gerald? I'm agreeing with what Treadway said over Facebook, which was I'd actually like the pace of it being slow like it was. It was more realistic to me to the point of if you have one guy that calls himself a viper and he's methodical and this and that, and you have another guy that's just the world's strongest man, I'm really not expecting a thousand and four holes. You know, I'm expecting it to be kind of hit or miss, kind of back and forth action like it was. And uh, we did. I was pleasantly surprised. I was thinking the politics were going to get played, but pleasantly surprised that Mark Henry won cleanly again. I'm just hoping he holds on to it for a while. Like you say, when they keep it simple like this, you know, good things happen. Yeah. And we also see how a lot of times, I've seen it myself, how one thing can come across as as far as crowd reaction goes, how the crowd can seem to go one way in the arena and it doesn't seem like it translates to live TV. So I don't know if that's going to factor in here, but Corey, I'm going to ask you, watching at home, how it played out when you were watching it on your computer screen. Actually, pretty well. I've, I've got to say this. Where was this fire out of Mark Henry 15 years ago? He has never done this well before. This was actually a pretty decent match, even though it was slow. And thank God Orton does not have that damn title again. Okay, but you say that, Corey, but how do you know he didn't have this in him all along? He's never really been put in this position before. Good point, good point. It could be that this is just one of the first times the booking team has decided to take him seriously. And I'm not counting the ECW title. No, no, they don't count that anymore. But this was actually an all right match. And Henry did really well. He won cleanly, and I don't actually have too many complaints other than the match could have been a little bit faster. I did it! I said something nice about Mark Henry! Take that, Hodge! Well, you said something nice of WWE by proxy, too. On our line also is Abe in Augusta, Georgia. Hey, Abe. Is this Abe Freeman? Yes, sir. You have some of the hottest fucking women as your friends on Facebook. How do you do it? <laughs> okay. You're you're close, so you're number two. Actually, you got one. <laughs> I got to keep up appearances. So anyway, oh. Abe, what's on your mind? Corey, you you finally get there some credit. You finally did, you got there's some credit this year for the year's over with. Congratulations. Yes, thank you, and I'm not being paid for it either. <laughs> yeah, we should be paid to do this show, though. That's the point. We need more people to support the show. Then we can get on a, a fucking real network and let's make this my full-time job in wrestling instead of sitting behind a desk and ring crew or whatever the hell else I've been doing the past seven years. Anyway, oh, no. moving on. What I just said about Mark Henry is it's old school. Going to the next segment, which was Cody Rhodes unveiling the old school 
intercontinental title with a white strap, a la Shawn Michaels, I suppose. I don't think it's 100% the exact same design. It looks slightly different to me, but all the same, the intention's there. And you notice when he brings out the title, which I thought was just beautifully connected to his gimmick, where the belt needs a makeover. He's obsessed with how things physically look, and therefore we get the title transitioning back to what it used to look like. Perfect explanation right there. But anyway, you saw, or you heard, the reaction that this got. Gerald, could you tell us what it was like when he took out the old design of the Intercontinental title in the arena? We could see that the guy was holding a belt, so all we could do was just hope and pray that, yes, this was the classic title belt. As Mm -hmm. far as the difference in the design, right off the bat, I'm feeling like it was just smaller, a la like what's going on with the World Heavyweight title right now. But other than that, um, yeah, it was pretty close to the same design, and yet we popped pretty big for it because we've been wanting to see that back for a long time now. So, And most of us said the same thing, which is, hey, glad to see this one, and I'm hoping they follow suit with that WWE title pretty soon. All their belts, really, and here's why I think people feel this way. Those designs from the time period that this belt is from, and I'm talking about the Gold Eagle, the old world tag titles, all that stuff. Those designs lasted for so long, and they were during WWE's real prominent years for our generation, growing up in the Hulk Hogan era into the new generation, and it lasted until the beginning of the Attitude Era, too. And even the belts that came after it were close enough to that. We've gotten fucking far away from it with the ridiculous spinning toy and the gladiator helmets and all that other shit that's on belts now. Now, I know it's just a belt. What about the design? Some people don't care, but I do, and here's why. Keeping those designs for so long connects you to history in an important way, and here's what I mean. The Stanley Cup has never changed its design, right? So if a team wins it this year and they hold up the Stanley Cup, it's the same design as it was decades ago. Could you imagine how cool it would be to see, not that I think they should go back to even the pre-Hogan belt in the Backlund era, which was big and green and ugly, but just imagine if the Gold Eagle belt that Hulk Hogan won, and Macho Man, and Bret Hart, and Ric Flair, and Shawn Michaels, and Austin, and all these other huge names, if wrestlers were holding that belt now, like if Alberto Del Rio was holding the big Gold Eagle belt now, it's such an easy way to connect to history. And ever since the post-Attitude era, In the Attitude Era, they didn't give a fuck about history at all. But ever since then, when they own history and it's okay now, and they want to sell the 24-7 channel on demand and now the upcoming network, being that they want to connect to history and they brought back the Hall of Fame and all this other shit, wouldn't it be just cool to visually see a connection there between the current generation and the old generation? Wouldn't that make them seem more on par? Of course, booking's a huge thing too, but just visually viscerally it would just connect it so much i think so i think that's why that belt design in particular got such a great reaction and i'm sure you probably agree with that Corey. so let's just move on to the match that was made right after that impromptu cody rhodes defending the belt against john morrison i refuse to call him joe mo or any other million fucking stupid nicknames this guy's been given or thinks up if they put half as much effort into booking him right as they do into his nicknames he'd probably be a lot further ahead than he is now. But anyway, Cody Rhodes, John Morrison, your thoughts, Corey? This was an all right match, and I have to say it was a welcome addition seeing the old belt design back. It is slightly different from the original, but it represents so much, and it was nice seeing that belt brought back and brought back in a very stylish way. The match was all right, unexpected, because, of course, this was booked last minute, but for being a last-minute booked match, it was all right. And in the arena, Gerald, how was John Morrison and Cody Rose? Well, it was a pleasant surprise just to have the match. We thought we were going to kind of get cut short. That worked out well for us. Cody was already on my good side from throwing out those names for the old lineage for the IC belt. got to give Cody credit for wrestling in the suit and the shoes like he did. And it's just like you say about Morrison and the bad booking, I mean... He was brought back like that. When you're broke like that, of the COO puts you in the match and you show back up and you get a pretty decent pop from the crowd because we weren't expecting it to be him. And so he came out and they had a pretty solid match. And like I say, somebody give credit for, to Cody for he wrestled in a damn suit. <laughs> Will Brooks, your thoughts on the Intercontinental design coming back from the grave? I loved it. Anything that goes back to its roots, 
especially in wrestling, I'm a big fan of, especially nowadays when they could use more of it. Well, I said the way they've been booking Mark Henry's been old school in a sense, too. What do you think about how Mark Henry's been doing lately and the reaction to it? Again, I love it. The way they did it was like going up to it. Like if he didn't win a title, I would have been pissed off. How do you give somebody so much heat and then turn it off? I think if they didn't win a title, it would have been all for nothing. So I'm glad they did it. And I've been loving it ever since. Just like you said, his promos aren't, like, over the top. They're just nice and simple and they're to the point, which is what you want him to do. Could care for like that. Should do. If he does this whole elaborate promo like John Cena, make, it would make no sense to the character. Mm-hmm. So I like what he's doing with that. And he always takes a belt back. I'm going to be very disappointed because I feel, you know, he's had a title a good amount of times. I think he'd be better off if he didn't get a title right now and builds back up to it. It will mean more. Keep the spell on Henry. I don't mean that just because he's my guy in the Battle of the Wills. <laughs> well, it seems like they're transitioning into a big show feud now, but I'm going to transition into a call in the chat room. He's Blue Blazer, and he's from Portland. I'd prefer a real name, but whatever. You're on the line now. What do you got to say on Roundtable? Seeing the IC title come back last night at Hell in a Cell pay-per-view, it doesn't do anything much to bring, like, that second in-command sort of deal. So, I mean, like, what WWE really needs to do is combine titles to have it to the four-title formula again. Because we know in today's modern era that world heavyweight title is the second best wrestler. So if we want that to be the intercontinental title, we need to combine the world championships and just have it solely WWE and have it IC slash US or whatever. So I don't know what you guys think. Well, that opens up a whole can of worms. Um, well, when they first did the brand split in 02, the idea was to make the Intercontinental title the secondary belt, so to speak, because they put Brock on SmackDown. He was the, quote, undisputed champion. Triple H vetoed that idea, and instead of being that the Intercontinental title was the Raw belt, we had him rehash the big gold belt because he's an old NWA fan and he wanted to hold it like his hero, Ric Flair, and Harley Race and whatever. And then they were really getting rid of a lot of the secondary belts. We saw the unification Rob Van Dam did with the hardcore title and the European title, which was necessary, I think. Unfortunately, it continued into the World Heavyweight title and Intercontinental title at No Mercy 02 with Triple H and Kane, and I thought it sucked, especially when they did that video package before the match detailing the history of the Intercontinental title, and it really made you like, why are they getting rid of this? That didn't last long either. They brought it back anyway because, I mean, come on, you just had to. As it is, I think we have to wait to see how this Super Show stuff plays out because being that SmackDown wrestlers are all over Raw and there's so many three-hour Raws coming up, but Raw wrestlers aren't going on SmackDown, it seems like the brand split's still hanging on by a thread, even if by a thread. But... Just seeing... That's another thing, too, though. I mean, like, whatever WD management is doing, like, they are going to kill their roster with this combination of superstars going in, in and out from different shows. If we had the brand split, wrestlers were working, like, less time per week, and now with both of them combining, it's going to... I mean, I read an article saying that JR looked at all the roster kids and said how they're all beat up come from Hell in the South. So I was like, whoa, dude, like... You're going to kill this roster, and they're so, you have such young talent, like, you're going to mess it up. I have to agree with that. That's putting these wrestlers at a great risk that I have to admit I didn't think about until JR brought it up. With the schedule being the way it is, these guys work four shows between Monday and Tuesday. Then they have one day of rest, one day of travel, and then they've got the house shows and pay per view between Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. This is not very healthy for your athletes. This is going to do a lot of damage for them. We're looking at a much larger injury list. Not necessarily, and I think it's because it's all an illusion. The brand split, in effect, is all an illusion. It's really not that different than the 80s when the schedule was much worse, by the way, where they had three tiers of rosters. There would sometimes be three different WWF shows going on at the same time in the country. It's just that different wrestlers would headline different shows. And all the wrestlers wanted to be on the Hogan show, of course, because Hogan drew the most money, and therefore if that trickled down to them, the gate was bigger, they got a bigger percentage. So it's essentially the same idea. It doesn't necessarily mean that there won't be a Raw house show at the same time or same weekend as a SmackDown house show. If they just took away the names Raw and SmackDown and did the same sort of touring schedule, it'd be the same thing. So the brand split's just an illusion, really. So that being said, they really ought to just do that 
and I mean unifications, if they're going to go that route. They could keep the same idea going, and it might even help SmackDown, because in their mind, oh, more Raw wrestlers from the A show on SmackDown will help the show. And if they're going to be doing live SmackDowns going forward anyway, what's the difference? It's the same day, so I don't know. I, I just really never really believed in the brand split, and I had always said that the blow-off for the brand split would be when they finally do a Raw versus SmackDown type pay-per-view or event to end it. Of course, we saw the video game series Raw versus SmackDown and some cute spots at Survivor Series or Royal Rumble or WrestleMania with inter-brand matches and all this stuff, and people popped for it because they'd see a bunch of T-shirts and they just viscerally react to that. <laughs> one's red, one's blue, yippee skippy. But it just seems like they're fading that out slowly instead of blowing it off in one big sort of unification and Teddy Long versus Triple H and the laptop sort of fucking rivalry or whatever it is. So I think it's going to go away eventually at some point, and I don't think it'll make that much of a difference. So I don't think things will get much worse than they are now. In the chat room, Wookum Boo, that must have been a name assigned to him when he signed in, said, you know what's funny? I feel like WWE has trained me not to watch the matches anymore. Well, of course, welcome. You know how wrestling is now. It's exactly what South Park said. It's the whoever the best talker is. I mean, we see how many times in the main event slot is a talking segment. So we'll get to that later when we get to Raw. Uh, last question. What do you think The Rock's uh, contribution is going to be come Survivor Series? Well, I mean, we pretty much know he's going to be in the tag match with John Cena. I assume it'll be Rock and Cena teaming up. Uh, against some fucking team, but I'm pretty sure that Survivor Series is going in the direction of all the conspiracy guys of like Dash and some other heels against Triple H in a face group or whatever, but I don't know if Rock and Cena are going to be connected to that, but uh, everyone's been saying they want Rock more involved in pay-per-views coming up. Now all of a sudden he's going to be at Survivor Series, which is of course in Madison Square Garden, so they're going to promote it up as he comes back to where it all started. It was his first pay-per-view or match for WWE on TV, Survivor Series 96 in the same building, so they're going to do that. Maybe he'll do something at the Rumble or some pay-per-views here and there, but uh, that's about as far as I see it going. But, hey, more rock. I'm happy for that. I believe there Actually, was more hell in the cell. There is, there is, there is. I'm getting back to that. <laughs> <laughs> so Beth Phoenix finally wins the Divas title from Kelly Kelly. At eight and a half minutes, this must have been like an Iron Woman match for Kelly Kelly. About a month too late, after Beth Phoenix wrestled in Buffalo, her hometown at Night of Champions, after months of waiting, Beth Phoenix finally gets the women's title. Gerald, how was it live in the building? Were you were you happy to see this? Was anybody else happy to see this? <laughs> I guess it was maybe the beginning was okay, and the ending was just that. I mean, hey, we're like, okay, fine, they gave it to Beth finally. I mean, I would have really appreciated them giving it to her in our hometown. It was a pleasant surprise. I saw SummerSlam on pay per view, and that was a pleasant surprise to have a decent match like they did for SummerSlam. I didn't see Night of Champs, but they could have gave the belt to the lady in her hometown. So it was a matter of just, okay, well, they finally did the right thing. Uh, I guess never say never, never too late, I guess. But other than that, it was a typical restroom break of a Divas match. I stayed to see it all because hell, I paid to get in. Other than that, yeah, this is the one match that we pretty much fell out for. Well, if she had won the belt in Buffalo, they probably would have been like, well, we don't want the heel to get cheered. Like, who gives a fuck? Anyway, Corey, some people were saying (laughs) that Hugh Jackman runs the ropes better than Kelly Kelly. I'm probably inclined to agree with that, but uh, your thoughts on Kelly Kelly finally dropping the belt to Beth Phoenix? At fucking last. I don't know what anybody sees in Kelly Kelly. This bitch can't wrestle. This bitch can't talk. And for somebody who has been billed as a face for over a year, you'd think she'd act like one. She acts more like a heel than the other heels. This match was eight minutes too long. I'm sorry that Beth didn't win this belt sooner. Clearly she's a better wrestler. Clearly she deserves this win. If I was a booker, I would be booking Beth as a face. And Natty as a face, not Kelly. I hope from here on out they will book her as a face because even in this crowd, there were more people cheering Beth than Kelly. Now, a lot of people I noticed complained to high heaven because Natty, uh, Natalia, I should say, hit Kelly upside the head with the microphone, helping Beth win. Some people look down upon that. I say more power to Natalia. I'm sorry she didn't whack the bitch a second time. That was actually kind of cute. She's very endearing, even as a heel. She's quite endearing, and 
kudos to Beth Phoenix. Thank God she won that belt. Now, hopefully, we can throw that in the trash can and bring back the women's title. Let's bring back the one that had Moolah's face on it. That was a cool belt. I do need to say something about um, the brand. You were saying about the brand split. You kind of skipped over me, though. I'm probably the only person in the world who doesn't want the brand split to go away because we always complain about we don't see Zack Ryder enough on TV or all these other young, talented guys. But if we get rid of the brand split, we're never going to see these guys wrestle. You think they can I don't see what the difference for, is, though. Well, that's no fault for screwing it up, basically. They could have so many more guys on TV and do more stuff, but they don't do it. They keep putting the same guys out four or five times on the same show. It gets really old. Exactly. That is their fault because people always say, well, if you end the brand split, that means less spots for people and less stars made and whatever. You know what? They had a huge roster 10 years ago or whatever, too, let's say in 2000, and no one was saying we need a brand split. It's the same idea. I don't know if they just got it in their head. I don't know why you need to have the same wrestlers on every single show every single week. I think that's just ridiculous, but that seems to be the Monday night mentality that they're stuck in since the the, the war period. So I really don't see the difference, especially if you look at their pay-per-views. Every month, it's the same idea. It's the same thing. I don't see what the difference is, but go ahead. No, I understand what you're saying, Eric, and you're not wrong. I think a brand split could work if you just had better writing. Like back sure. in the day when Paul Heyman was the head writer for SmackDown. SmackDown was a cool show. So you could watch both shows and be entertained and not have to worry about stupid money that made no sense. You mm-hmm. could have watch two different kind of shows and have fun doing it. You could see a lot of good wrestling. You don't just see the same ten dudes in for a two-hour show. The only way it would work if they made Raw three hours. Well, don't be surprised if that happens. They become more and more like Nitro every passing week. Pat from Illinois, who is on our Facebook page all the time and our message board all the time. You're on Roundtable now, live on the air. What do you have to say, Pat? Well, I got a few things, but I guess since you brought up the brand split, I guess when you have a roster, back when this whole thing started, you got Booker T, Van Dam, you got Benoit, Guerrero, and all these guys. Yeah, you've got a ton of talent that at least have a somewhat established name in the business. Right now, you're not building a damn thing. And that's the biggest thing of what we're going to be talking about in a minute, which is the main event, which should have been built into something really hot from the end of Hell in a Cell with Miz and Truth, which turned out into one of maybe the single worst segments I've seen in the better part of a decade in wrestling, which ended up being the Triple H no-confidence crap that I saw last night. Woohoo! Could you do me a favor and say, <laughs> Tobit Spirit Guide? What do you want me to say, man? Sorry. <laughs> Never mind. I just feel like I'm talking to Harold Ramis. <laughs> oh, I, you know, the funny thing is, is I hear that I have that voice all the time. I just so watched Strike this weekend, and I thought of your voice immediately. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, man. I appreciate that. Hey, I'm a Harold Ramis fan. I'm sure you, you, no, you look nothing Harold like Ramis him, so it's okay. No, I appreciate that. But, yeah, I mean, again, the brand split was a great idea when you had a bunch of established names on your roster or at least guys that people saw from the Nitro and Raw peak days. Now you, you really are trying to build new guys, maybe a Zack Ryder or anything like that. Really the brand split now is essentially useless because now – Really, you have a very small pool of guys that you really are trying to, quote-unquote, push. So I don't really see what the point of it is anymore. All right. Well, you just mentioned the main event, and let's move on to that, because it was a three-way Hell in a Cell, the first ever, if you could believe that. I mean, the champion, John Cena, on his 10th WWE title reign, 12th world title, for those keeping track at home, and obviously Chavo Guerrero is, versus CM Punk and Alberto Del Rio. And much like everyone was expecting, they put the belt right back on ADR a month after taking it off him for no, well, not even a month, a few weeks, for no reason. At least he did it in a cheating, conniving way where Cena was locked out of the cage and he used a pipe. So at least he didn't even pin the champion to win it. So he did it like a sneaky heel should, at least. But how did it play out in the arena, Gerald? Well, like you say, he wanted like a sneaky heel should. We kind of expected it to go longer, at least that ending portion of it, of just the, by the time he got the three count, we were just kind of stunned at like, you know, what the hell this kind of ended kind of soon. And we expected something else to go on with that. And uh, well, little did we know they had it on at the end afterwards. It uh, had that old school feel to it to me. I, I felt like it had some common sense to it as far as Miz and Truth get thrown out at the beginning of the show, we're even chanting, you know, let them stay. 
and it had that feel of they say like, hell no, we won't go, and they show back up at the end. And then from there, it might have seemed like a closer fuck on TV, but uh, to us it just, like I say, it felt kind of old school, and it had that nice run-in lumberjack type feel to it. And uh, it gave us just enough of a question mark to see what would happen the next night. Unfortunately, it kind of spiraled like it did on Raw, but at least at the end of our show, we felt like, okay, hell, they want me to see the rest of these of this year's pay-per-views, at least, if nothing else. And we were overall, we were happy that we gave them the dollars. Well, we felt like, yeah, the match ended a little too suddenly, a little too suddenly. We felt like something else could have went on with that, or maybe they could have let Super Cena show up and bust open the cage door somehow. Well, before I get everyone else's opinion on the main event, Gerald, which apparently did go off the air half an hour before 11. You said you were happy about giving them your money, so how was the overall experience of going to this WWE pay-per-view and your overall view of the show? I felt like whoever was in control of it uh, obviously should have been in control of Raw the next night. Overall, I was worried that it would be a throwaway pay-per-view, but it wasn't because everybody's matches, aside from the most of the action from the Divas match, everybody's match was good to great, Yeah, even the dark match. So I felt like overall... They came through for us, and if nothing else, uh, we decided just to be a good crowd from from Jump Street, and we saw what we wanted to see, basically. I would have preferred CM Punk winning the belt just because, <laughs> but uh, Del Rio winning it was a nice touch the way he did. All right, well, I'm glad you had a good time, and thanks for calling in and let us know how it was with your live reporting on it, so to speak. Gerald, your live account, Eyewitness, Roundtable fan. So, Corey... Going to go to you first, main event. The match itself was all right. I actually did like how Alberto Del Rio won by locking Cena out of the cage and taking a lead pipe. That was something out of old school Ric Flair's book. What happened after that was a sinful debacle. And yes, as you mentioned, Eric, the show ended a half a fucking hour early. And I feel sorry. I know because you tweeted about that all upset. Yeah, because for the forty-four or fifty-four ninety-nine pay-per-view price, I expect a full three-hour show. This is a page out of TNA's book where you cut the feed a half an hour early. That's incredibly unprofessional. What happened afterwards were the cage partially lifted, and then our truth and Miz slide in and cause chaos. And truth takes the cage, slams it down. A, Suppose breaking the pulley that would have lifted the cage because nobody got the fucker up after that. After that, they have Johnny Ace come out. The guy at the booth, they show him on camera, pushing every last button. Nothing is working. This cage is dead. It's not going anywhere. Then they call out the roster and the referees and police, and they have somebody come out with a pair of pliers to cut the chain because, God forbid, we figure out to undo the ties on the sides of the cage. That was not a good visual. That did not translate well via the pay-per-view feed. The entire thing ended in a clusterfuck. It was very confusing. It made very little sense. And it just did not look good at all. The fact that they ended the pay-per-view right as Triple H is being pulled away, no, that's not a visual I wanted to see. I did not need to see our truth in handcuffs. I didn't need to see Miz in handcuffs, didn't need to see Triple H having a temper tantrum. That's time that should have gone to something else. You cut the pay-per-view feed a half an hour early. Uh, Let me ask you guys something. When you booked this six-match card, you know, on the seat of your pants, did it occur to you that this was a three-hour broadcast? Did you even think for one minute, hey, instead of dark matching them, how about we take this Daniel Bryan match and put it on the feed? It's not going to have any buildup, but at the very least it will fill out that extra half an hour. Did anybody in the back think that nobody was going to catch this? This was entirely crass and unprofessional, and it just did not translate well. Okay, we get it. So (laughs) I see some more calls. going to go to them in a minute, but before I do, Will Brooks, this is, what, the fourth pay-per-view in a row or so where the world titles, a WWE title, changed hands. Not a lot of consistency here. What do you think about the title switch back to ADR? Well, it helps me on the Battle of the Wills competition, but as a fan of wrestling, I'm not too big on the whole idea of it changing every single month. You know, the only reason why it worked in the Attitude Era was because it was different. You know, we were used to long title range, and Hot Shining Belt was something new, was something different. And it no, made I of- think it just worked because the product was hot, and it didn't matter how bad the show was, people watched anyway. <laughs> Well, it was also, that's part of it too, but also the fact that it made you tune in, like, oh man, I wonder if the boat's going to change hands tonight. Oh my God. 
Now it's like, oh, my God, if I see that belt change hands one more goddamn time, holy shit. I just find it sad how, like, we had the hottest angle in wrestling for the last couple of years with CM Punk, and now it's been pre- almost pretty much fizzled into nothing, and it changed into, instead of CM Punk going against the establishment, now it's Triple H being, uh, getting, almost getting, losing his job in charge. How the hell yeah. did all this change from CM Punk being the hottest thing in wrestling to Triple H? I'm so goddamn sick and tired of him. God damn it. I every time there's something good going on in wrestling, he's got to put his big fucking beak in it. I'm so sick of this shit, man. He ruins everything. Well, we'll talk more about Triple H in a little bit. Callers, Pat, you're up first. Any more thoughts on the result of Hell in a Cell? I had no major problem with the whole thing with Miz and R-Truth. I thought if that at least was building to maybe some sort of grand angle where maybe we got back to the punk thing. You know, maybe he was playing this kind of nice guy role, maybe p- partnering with Cena or something. Maybe we were leading to some like big grand thing that brought back to punk and how he fought Triple H by kind of almost pretending he was on his side or something. Maybe that would have all made sense. So when I saw them kind of go in there and attack everybody, I was fine until I hate to say it, but until they attack Punk, because now I'm kind of like, well, that pretty much killed any chance of this going any deeper. And so now it's kind of like, well, what you got on Monday night ended up being the huge clusterfuck that it was. And I don't know if I blame Triple H entirely for it. At the same time, I guess he is part of the McMahon clan now. So maybe he deserves some of the blame, too. Well, we all know who his final say, and it ain't Triple H yet. Ben from Austin, Texas, you're on the round table. What do you got to say? I know you already talked about death before the summer night tomorrow. H, that was my first RH pay per view. But I were you there the or did you order it? I I ordered it. That's a, it was a last second thing. Um, okay. And uh, when I saw that they were doing the preview show, and I liked the dark match that they showed, um, with, I believe it was Grizzly Red. But to me, I guess I think it was Will Fafitos who was kind of lost, like, I kind of lost interest in the pay-per-view, um, because I didn't mm-hmm. know who any of the wrestlers were, and I guess my question is, um, do you feel that preview shows should be, I guess, either highlights or, like, here's why you should care about these wrestlers, here's what's been going on, and, like, the Kevin scene, I had no idea what was going on. I was shocked by it, but I had no idea what was going on. So you weren't familiar with Ring of Honor going in? No, I... I Heard some of the names from that y'all have talked about on the show, but never seen a show personally myself. Interesting. Well, yes, being that I hosted one of the, or co-hosted, I should say, one of ROH's preview shows earlier this year, the whole idea is to hype you into buying the pay-per-view. Now, this being an iPay-per-view, lower level, it's a little different. You see a preview show on an internet channel, it is different, too, and we've seen different styles over the years, especially in 96 when WWF started the free-for-all where they would actually have live matches aired because they always had dark matches. They just never aired them. Preview shows before that were usually just in the studio pre-taped highlights of the latest angles and the hype going into it. So I think there's a balance there. Grizzly Redwood and Andy Ridge, Andy Right Leg Ridge, were the pre-show match on this one. And they at least used it in the storyline context of Andy Ridge, I believe, qualifying for a survival of the fittest qualifying match, something like that. I think it should be a mix of both, especially if we have a new viewer like you, Ben, who's not familiar with the product necessarily. Obviously, there's going to be some names you might recognize who were in WWE like Hassan Benjamin or in TNA like Homicide and Rhino and whoever. But there's also going to be their own originals, so to speak, that you might not know or be not completely familiar with. So I think it's a real fine balancing act. It's good to show there's a sold-out Hammerstein and there's a hot crowd for it and maybe some good wrestling action as just a little taste of what you're going to get. But at the same time, you also have to feed information to the people. Here's why you should buy the show. Here's who you should care about. So I think there's a fine balance there. Did you have anything else you wanted to say? I am definitely going to buy the next RH I pay per view. Just really, I, while I was a little dissatisfied, it left me curious enough to buy the next pay per view. So whatever they did worked. Fuck never seen. <laughs> All right, we've got Royce out in Pomona, California. What's going on, Royce? The guy who likes to spam our Facebook group page with pictures 
and likes to troll the smart marks. What's up? And likes Kurt Angle porn, apparently. Oh, thanks for that grand introduction, guys. This is for all the people who listen on YouTube. All the people who keep going on about how we want the Attitude Era back. I hope you like this era. I hope you like this because nothing but nonsensical swerves, like a thousand title changes in under, like, how many months? Isn't that basically the Attitude Era in a nutshell? And people well, I think to... you just take away the tits, the blood, and the cursing, and we still have the Attitude Era. So why are people salivating over that? They, we still have it. We're still living. We're still living it. And Stylistically, uh, pretty much. Uh, I just don't get it. To call back to something you said earlier about how we just have to keep it simple, I think last night on Raw and Hell in a Cell basically proved that point. When they just have people like Cena and Punk... And just like I guess people who are draws just wrestle, people like it. And when you involve um, you know, like Triple H and since like since O three man, anytime something hot like either whether it be Eugene or NWO or what have you, he sticks his big honker into it and sniffs all the heat out of it, I guess, because it's like we're back to square one, man. Nothing it's interesting, and this is coming from a guy who's not that big of a, a fan of punk in the first place. Well, here we are now, just people walking off Raw, which I don't get. You mean, tell me we have satanic sacrifices, people getting ran over by cars, street fights every other week, people getting kidnapped. Well, it was only a couple years ago that DX was dropping, quote, shit, or excrement, or whatever, raw sewage on the McMahon. So that was, of course, before Linda decided to run for Senate, so we're not going to get it exactly like that. But to your point about keep it simple, characters will always be more over than any of that shit. For instance, you could have the best wrestling in the world. It could be Davey Richards and Eddie Edwards, or it could be Dynamite Kid and Tiger Mask. And those are all great matches. But if people aren't invested in your character... Who gives a fuck? Good wrestling can only go so far. Look at ECW. There was just a little bit good wrestling, and then they got signed to WCW, pretty much. And it was just all character-based and storyline shit that got people into ECW. The characters were memorable. And I can further exemplify this in the fucking Attitude Era itself. If we go back, like I said, to 98, and I've made this point on the show before, this is how I believe when people, even Bischoff, if he does say it, If people say that one of the reasons WCW didn't get ahead in the Attitude Era is because standards and practices from AOL came down and they couldn't do all the raunchy shit that WWF could, so that's why they fell behind and they seemed kiddie, PG, like the Nintendo of wrestling, I guess. But in 1998, this is the time when wrestling was at its hottest, WCW made its most money, WWF got the momentum back with Austin, Mike Tyson, DX, and all that shit. Okay. So WCW pretty much lost from WrestleMania 14 onwards that whole year. But they had three times when they had spikes in the ratings, whether they won a quarter or whether they won the night. And those three times were when Warrior debuted in August against Hogan, when Flair returned in September to rejoin the Horsemen and come back for the first time that year, I believe, or whatever, and when Hogan fought Goldberg. Not one tit, not blood, not one chair shot. No violence, no stupid storyline, no anything like that that the typical Attitude Era presented. No beer. None of that stuff was in any of those segments, and yet they drew. Why? Because people cared, and they gave people what they wanted to see in that instance. So I think that just goes to prove your point to a degree, Royce. But let's move on to Monday Night Raw, or I should say Raw Super Show, since it's maybe going to be like this for the foreseeable future. Last night, and... The segment everyone's talking about is the vote of no confidence, which was the main event segment with Triple H and everyone walking out on him, including the cameraman. Nice, cute touch. And I've got a lot to say about it, but I'm sure everyone else does, too. So I will let everyone else go first. I've seen pretty universally negative reviews about it. People hated it. I've seen a few people sticking up for it, that they're intrigued where it's going to go, want to see the next show. They thought it was well done, blah, blah, blah. Let's see where you guys fall. Will Brooks? You're up first. Tough, you know. Again, my whole hatred for Triple H is pretty obvious. So him, like, being fired, even if it's just for show, is awesome to me. I forget who it was. It might have been Royce who put up the video of when the, when they did this in, like, 2001 with The Rock. You know? That was Corey who posted on her Facebook group the yeah, first Corey. time 
that the roster protested Triple H in charge, which was the McMahon-Helmsley era, and logically made much more sense back then. It did, and sorry, Corey, I should give you credit for that. It was Corey. It was actually kind of funny seeing how small Triple H was back then before he got his uh, leg injury. I don't know. It sucks. I just think it's weird how like everybody like, I don't feel safe. You fucking wrestle. You're a wrestler. <laughs> don't feel safe. Fuck out of here. Give us something a little bit more credible than that. Like, listen, Triple H, we don't like the way you're running company. We think you're not doing a good enough job because you suck ass. Damn. You play politics too much. Cool. Why the hell are you going to say it's unsafe? Man, that makes no damn sense. Ugh. Then you have Beth Phoenix and Triple H. Everybody who says something, Triple H undermines them. It's like, can you for once just let somebody go over on you? Please, just fucking just take a hit or something. God damn it. The only thing I thought was kind of cool was how everybody walked out. Like, not even just the wrestlers. The refs walked out. And then the announcers walked out. The ring announcer, you hate. The guy who rings the bell walked out. The cameraman walked out, which I thought was kind of cool. Like, okay, okay, that's nice. That's different. Even JR walked out. Like, everybody walked out, which I thought was kind of cool. I was expecting that they kind of like to cut the cameras at one point, like go to Fuzz or stand by to do your programming, you know, like anything like that. But ultimately, no, nah, I wasn't too huge on it. Again, maybe it's because I was still pissed off how they just did a complete 180 with this whole angle. Like I explained earlier, how it was so cool with Drew Stanley Punk that somehow uh, Triple H gets his fucking ass in it and then it ruins it. I guess it was cool, but at the same time, taking it in context, it really sucked ass. So, I don't know. Yeah, Jim Ross being the last to leave, like, not even you too, JR, was a very cute touch. Some comments before we go to you, Corey. Ezenwa on our message board, I believe, Thank yeah, you. said, want to know what's funny? Everyone walked out of Raw for the fact that WWE is in chaos with Triple H at the helm with an unsafe work environment caused mostly by two fired men, a fired legend and a world champion who's just been hurting people while under contract, which leaves Triple H responsible for his lack of competence. Yet last year, no one wanted to walk out when, say, seven to eight rookies were assaulting people on every show, and the only voice of reason with hints in a coma was a computer that received emails. I thought that was a great point. Also, on our message board, Last Ride said, I just noticed there were no matches announced tonight for the pay-per-view three weeks from now, which is uh, vengeance, so Raw will only have another two weeks to build up for matches. And that relates to what Rob Van Dam posted, not the wrestler, the screen name. Three pay-per-views in a span of six weeks is absurd, especially when they don't lower the price on any of them or even offer a package deal like all three for 90 I think that's a very good point, too. They should have considered that. This schedule is just getting ridiculous, and especially that SummerSlam buy rate should have been very worrying. CM Punk may be selling as much merchandise right now as John Cena, but neither one of them are selling that pay-per-view, and that's what it was really sold on. And really, the difference is this time, yeah, Cena main evented it, but he's also main evented other pay-per-views that sold. This was Punk's time, so you know a lot of that blame is going to go on him. But at any rate, Corey, your thoughts on the walkout? I want to bring up a point that Jamal on our Facebook brought up, because I clearly do not think that Miz and our truths little beatdown had anything to do with the walkout. Uh, Jamal posted, Triple H lectures to the heels about what happened to WWE, how it didn't matter when a man gets screwed over, they picked themselves up and they fought. Such great dialogue from a man who screwed a lot of people over. I happen to agree with Jamal. When Beth and the rest of them said they don't feel safe, I don't think that was about Miz and R-Truth at all. For all we know, they could have stayed their happy asses at home playing Wii. I think when she said they don't feel safe, they meant they don't feel safe politic-wise. The well, that's been this whole non-televised angle with Miz and our truth he, Triple H is a hypocrite. They had a valid point, and I believe that the roster had every right to walk out. I know nobody's going to like to hear me say that, but things have not been going great for WWE. Even before Triple H, we had people in charge that constantly undermined these guys, treat them like shit, treat them like circus animals. Let NXT be a perfect example of this. I'm not surprised at all that they walked out, and I'm not surprised that even JR and the ring crew decided to abandon Triple H. I feel that while none of this is his fault specifically, he's been pretty much built up by McMahon to be the scapegoat in the event that this company falls. Why Are you talking is... real or fake here, Corey? Because I can't tell if, you're, if you know the difference. I don't think anybody else can tell. That's really a testament to the writing for Raw. 
because no, Triple H is not in charge of the company yet. So there's that. <laughs> I think, though, that if he does take over for real, he's going to be nothing more than a scapegoat for when this sinking ship goes away. Based on what? Oh, based on what I have seen so far, Raw has become a farce. The last couple of weeks... It's it's been been a farce for a long time before they did this fake figurehead angle. The last couple of weeks, though, it feels more like a TNA taping where we have so many segments about business and the situation and all this backstage crap. We don't have any actual wrestling going on in the ring. I'm not surprised at this walkout at all, and there's something that needs to change here. You lose control of an entire roster if we're supposed to believe the storyline? Something's wrong. Something has definitely gone wrong here. I'm very shocked that so many people were so willing to abandon Raw after this. I saw nothing but hatred over this angle. And it even spilled They'll out They'll tune on in Twitter. next week. The rating went up this week anyway, so whatever. It went up. But uh, let, let's move on. Ford, Ford, that. Ford, can I say something? Yeah. Every time you talk, I get the image of, the, of that redneck guy who is still real to me, damn it. Do you, like, understand that it's a show? Like, this is yes, not I real. understand that it's a show. Then why do you always put like human emotion into this? Like as if like the guys had a choice. They're reading a script. This is how the show is going. You're making I'm it seem thinking like storyline wise. It's not fucking obvious. You, it makes me think you like think this shit is real. Like oh my no, god. No, I'm talking about the storyline. <laughs> and right okay, now it well, feels like a TNA taping. All right. Well, let's uh, go to somebody else. Royce in our chat room said three pay-per-views in three weeks. Sounds like UFC. Difference, Royce? People pay for those. So let's go to Pat. You're still on our line, I believe. Oh, yes. I'm not going to go as far as saying, oh, WWE is screwed because of this. However, I can tell you that Egon Spangler over here thinks that that really (laughs) fucking sucked last night. You you need to talk to McMahon and say, imagine WWE is this Twinkie. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, crossing the streams was a better idea, Eric, than this thing last night. Just terrible. Now, here's the main problem with it, is that this was a 30-minute segment. This thing went for a half an hour, and it was just people talking about unsafe working conditions. I'm going to sue Triple H for a sub. He was this fucking Ally McBeal. I mean, come on. This isn't a drama show. I mean, I know it's supposed to be kind of dramatic because it's a sports entertainment thing, but this thing really just went on and on. And you have all your great talkers, Miz, R-Truth, Punk, even Cena and whatever, and in the end, you have your main people talking being Mike Chioda and Beth Phoenix. Really? I I just think the entertainment value ended up going nowhere with this. Don't you think the people that were conspicuous by their absence, like Punk and Cena and whatever, that's going to play into what happens next week? I think they know the Triple H was going to get cheered and everybody out there but Triple H was going to get booed and they didn't want to put their top faces out there to get booed. That's why I think they weren't out there. And that's the only reason I think they weren't out there because they knew there was a good chance that everybody out there was going to get booed. Hmm. The fans seem to be really into Triple H at least, judging by the reaction. But uh, for this walkout segment on the vote of no confidence – Okay, they constantly call it the WWE Universe, right? And they're basing this off the Marvel Universe. I think that's where it started from. The problem is Marvel has lots of different universes. (laughs) I don't know how many different directions just the X-Men world has been split with multiple dimensions and time travel and all this other shit. So maybe they should just change WWE Universe to WWE Multiverse. I mean, I'm a physics fan, so I don't know if anybody else knows about multiple dimensions and string theory and blah, blah, blah. But it kind of makes sense for WWE World. I mean, in one dimension, Randy Orton just won the title by himself all of a sudden at SummerSlam 04. In another, Chris Benoit, I mean, he who we do not speak of actually did it. Depends on how they rewrite history. I mean, in one WWE Universe, Kane was a burned-up little kid who lived in the basement, and when he took off his mask, people freaked out. And then all of a sudden, in another universe, he takes off his mask, and he's not burnt at all. It was all in his head. So maybe it should be WWE Multiverse. But back to the segment itself, in the WWE Universe, as they call it, it didn't really make sense in terms of continuity and logic. And here's what I mean. When Corey posted those segments from January 2000 or whenever it was that The Rock led the roster to protest the McMahon-Helmsley era, a lot more worse shit went on back then to make the roster pissed off. 
people were fired. Referees were beat up. I mean, <laughs> Triple H shouldn't have been surprised Jim Ross up and left with no confidence when this was the guy who threatened to break his arm if he didn't get the title shot the day after <laughs> SummerSlam 99, which led to a tag match, by the way, of Triple H in uh, what was it? Triple H in China versus Jim Ross and somebody on Raw. I forget what. But anyway, like as in Wa said, just last year, with NXT, it was worse, quote-unquote, for the working environment then, let alone 13 years ago. I mean, why didn't the roster just do this in the height of the corporation of McMahon's power trip back then? So it, it didn't even make sense in the term in terms of WWE's universe. But that being said, I don't think for what it was, it was too bad. I know a lot of the big stars were left off, and Beth Phoenix and whoever were talking instead of Miz, but... I think it helped give other people some spotlight in an important angle at the very least. I thought it was hilarious when Beth Phoenix referred to us divas because that really could have meant all the wrestlers, not just the ones with vaginas. But I also think it's funny when Triple H fires Miz and R-Truth and says, your employees, you have to do what I say and blah, blah, blah. They're independent contractors, Triple H. Not the same thing. I'm sure there'll be a lawsuit about that again someday. One last thing about it, though, and I'll let everyone else talk some more if you want, but when Mike Chioda spoke specifically, and I was thinking about this whole working environment thing, I mean, I remember the angle, probably you do too, Pat, in September 99, when shit was out of control, too, and the referees picketed for like a week. Yeah, they were right, yeah, mm-hmm. of course. Shit was much worse back then, so what are they all no, no. upset about? So I thought... How much cooler would it have been, connecting back to the night before with Alberto Del Rio being the sneaky heel, if after Cena got locked out of the cage, he also put the referee in an arm bar, his finish, on both arms, so he broke both the referee's arms so he couldn't even make a pinfall count. That way, if Punk goes for a pinfall, the referee's got broken arms, he can't make the pinfall. And then he used a lead pipe on CM Punk's arm, so he cheats there too. And then he makes CM Punk tap out, which is visual, so then the ref rings the bell from that. And the reason I'm connecting it to that is because the referee's standing there looking fine, it didn't really ring true. Like, if they were beat up and in casts in, like, we can't do this anymore. It just seemed to have been a little more realistic to me. But let's see what else you guys think. Any more thoughts on the whole walkout segment, Corey? I think that's going to make SmackDown pretty interesting, seeing as how not everybody shows up for that taping. I still stand by what I said earlier, though. I think that they had the right to walk out, and I don't think this is the end of this storyline. Abe in Augusta, Georgia, any more thoughts? Well, I'm surprised you didn't make an Ebony and Ivory joke with The Miz and Arthur. All right, then. <laughs> Pat, any more? The people that are causing the more, most havoc, other than Miz and our truth uh, you have Wade Barrett with the Nexus thing, you have Mark Henry, and you have Alberto Del Rio, and all of them are out there standing amongst these people as if they're not a huge part of the problem. I, I mean, I know that we're supposed to, like, dumb it down as wrestling fans, but, boy, I have to be a freaking moron to not understand that the people that they're most fearful of are standing right out there with them. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make a lick of sense. Well, I mean, Alberto was standing right there next to the referee, and he was causing all that havoc the night before, too. Gerald, any thoughts on what happened on Raw? Well, I agree with Pat. And also, about Del Rio, uh, as far as even storyline and real-life-wise, if you're the WWE champion and you have what everybody else wants, it's like... You really have nothing to complain about. And so it's like, if I'm Del Rio, I'm in that segment from the other week with them talking to Otunga about getting this lawsuit together. And then after I win, I I come to them Monday night like, well, uh, you know, have a good fight. And uh, I got what I need. So, hell, I'm out of this bullshit. I'm interested to see where they're going with this, wherever it it may be. Royce, any more thoughts? Fuck punk and fuck kick pads. Um, Hey, what's wrong with kick pads? It just seems like every indie dirtbag has them now. They buy those before they buy trunks now, right? And that's the whole different story. Anyway, like you said earlier, it doesn't make sense. You mean in the same company that had satanic, like, rituals performed live on TV? And rest- no one bad in an eye. <laughs> it's, it's like kidnappings and murder attempts. And a few refs get beat up again, but somehow this is like the straw that breaks the camel's back. I don't get it. That's pretty dumb. As crappy as I thought it was, it did fulfill one accomplishment. It does make me want to watch next week to see what the hell is going to happen next, which at the end of the day, 
It's what they're going for. It is a TV show, and the only whole po- the whole point is to make you want- tune in next week. So I will tune in next week, curious to see what's going to happen. So good for them. Well, I hope everyone tunes in next time because next time in a couple of weeks we'll be talking about UFC 136, which is Edgar Maynard three. And TNA's Bound for Glory 2011, which happens at the Aaliyah Chorus Center in Philadelphia. Wills, both of them, and myself will be attending. We're hoping to do a blog there, too, so if you're going to the show, look for our camera. And coming up this Sunday, we're going to be taping two new shows, video shows, finally. After a long layoff, the wait is almost over. We will be talking about wrestling's next boom period. We've talked about the Attitude Era before in the Monday Night Wars. But what's going to bring wrestling back into the mainstream? What could it possibly be? Was it going to be Punk's promo, this reality era that he was pushing, or something else? We're also going to be talking about the NWO, the New World Order, and its impact on wrestling, its legacy, its history. We're also going to look back on The Rock's career, building up the Survivor Series and his return to WWE after seven years or so. A look back at The Rock's impact in his career, also the best and worst swerves in wrestling. And in the meantime, please join us on WrestlingRoundtable.com. We're also on Facebook. we got two pages there, a fan page and a group page. We're on YouTube. We're on iTunes. On iTunes and Blog Talk Radio, you can get every show we've ever done in audio form. That's nearly 90 shows. So check out our archives. You can find a whole listing for those on Blog Talk Radio, iTunes, and WrestlingRoundtable.com. We're also on Go Fight Live. Whole shows on Go Fight Live of the video and radio show as well. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Exclusive content on there too. We're all over the place. Sign up for the message board and join our fans in the chat room and message board and keep up with Wrestling Roundtable. So for the panel of Coriander Ake, Will Brooks, and all the callers, thank you very much. I'm Eric Santa Maria. Join us in a couple weeks and stay tuned for Wrestling Roundtable.